We've seen the basic mechanics of the simplex method, this idea of iteratively uh, deciding whether the objective function can be improved by looking for positive coefficients in the expression of the objective function, and then pivoting and then checking again and, and continuing to do that until we reach a state where the objective function can't be increased any further. But in the previous lecture, I pointed out that there are still a bunch of loose ends that we have to tie up. There are a lot of them. Things like how do we select the entering variable, but also more immediately, issues like what about the cases where the LP doesn't have a solution at all? And also, what about cases where we can't start the simplex method because one of the invariants isn't being met? Um, and the key invariant, of course, that we care about usually is that all variables must be non-negative. And so the problems in general of what if there is no solution can be sort of wrapped up as either the problem is unbounded if it has no solution, or it's infeasible. So unbounded is a situation where there are feasible points, but we can make the objective function when we're maximizing as large as we want. So there is no specific single maximum. The infeasible case is where there simply aren't any points that satisfy all of the constraints. And we'll, we, that factors in pretty heavily to this initialization issue of how do we find a feasible dictionary to start from? So we'll start by talking about unboundedness, although really most of what I'm going to talk about today is that initialization problem. Um, so here's an LP along with a visualization of the feasible polytope. Notice that the feasible polytope has infinite area. We've got these edges with infinite length, and we've got, uh, and it, this just runs off to infinity in this direction. Now, I mentioned previously that it doesn't matter if the polytope is unbounded in some cases. An LP may still have an optimal solution even if the polytope is infinite in some direction. And that's the case here. So it turns out the optimal solution is this. It's at 2 thirds and 7 thirds. x equals 2 thirds, y equals 7 over 3. Uh, and yeah, the slides are reminding you, just because the feasible region is unbounded doesn't necessarily mean that the LP is unbounded. And what I want to talk about is, well, how do we detect the case where it is, but also is the fact that the feasible region is open at one end, that it's lacking a wall to close it off, is that something we should be worried about? And the answer to that question, fortunately, is no. It turns out that really nothing different happens if you try and solve this LP, as long as it actually has a solution. So we'll try it. The point zero, 00 is feasible, so I can run the simplex method starting from this initial dictionary, the one that I construct just by taking the uh, standard form and converting it to a dictionary notation. Notice that uh, the non-basic variables, of course, will be set to 0, but the basic variables are all positive numbers, so they're not negative, so this is valid. Um, and then if I, let's walk through it. I, I'm not going to belabor the steps, but I've left in all the steps so that you could use this later if you're uh, using the problem for practice. So uh, y enters and w2 leaves leaves, so I pivot, um, x enters and w3 leaves, and then I'm done. Okay, so I've got this, uh, the objective value is 9, and it occurs at x equals 2 thirds, y equals 7 thirds. There we go. Not really anything different. I mean, I performed a sequence of pivots. You could argue I never even had the opportunity to notice that there were some, there was some weird behavior in the, in the feasible region. Um, and so it turns out that if there is an optimal solution, you really can't expect anything different to happen uh, in the algorithm even though there were edges of that feasible region that have infinite length, and the feasible region itself had infinite area. It wasn't any big deal because there was an optimal solution. You might be staring at this, though, and wondering, how is there an optimal solution if the polytope is infinite? Um, and um, sorry, I, I'm skipping over something there. Uh, the answer is because if you look at the gradient of the objective function, so negative 4, 5, um, that's this arrow here. Notice that it points away from the infinite part of the feasible region, and that means if I'm standing here, I sort of get stuck in this corner. So there's no reason I want to go up this edge and see what's happening there, because that will not increase the objective value. And that's why uh, the algorithm was able to find that optimal solution. It's also worth considering that if I start down here, I'm just going to walk up along these two edges until I reach that. So I never need to, I never need to go any further, because this is the optimal solution and I'm done. Now consider this LP. So here, I, everything's the same except the objective function, where the gradient is now 4, 5, which points this way. 
And I'll notice that if I'm standing at this vertex, my previous optimal solution, then, um, or actually even if I start down here, if I were to go directly, I'll notice that I can keep increasing the objective value by just walking along this infinite edge. If I'm standing here, I can make the objective function a little bit larger by walking a little bit this way, and I can keep going. And of course, the edge is infinite, so as far, the further I walk along the edge, the bigger the objective function gets, which means there is no maximum. I can make the objective function as big as I want. Um, so we need to figure out what the simplex algorithm does here. And it turns out, actually, that um, it does behave differently, but it, we don't have to do anything different. The special case just sort of um, jumps out at us when the time comes. Um, so let's try solving it. So again, like before, the initial uh, dictionary at 0, 0 is feasible. So I can try using the simplex method to solve this LP. So I'll do that. OK, first step, y enters and w2 leaves x enters and w3 leaves, and then I end up here. So at this point, w2 is apparently my entering variable uh, because it has a positive coefficient, fair enough. So I guess I should pivot. Um, what's my leaving variable? Okay, so we know already that this, because w2 and w1 aren't related, w1 is not my leaving variable. We know that from the previous lecture. We also know that we have to choose our leaving variable um, to be whatever of the basic variables imposes the tightest bound on my entering variable. Um, and uh, by contrast, consider uh, this case here, where um, y was my entering variable, and if we consider, given the fact that x is 0, w2 would be 1 minus y. And I want to increase y to some positive number. But because I can't let w2 go negative, y has to be less than or equal to 1. Because if, for example, I chose y equals 2, then w2 would be 1 minus 2, which is negative 1, which I'm not allowed to do. So that means that y has to be at most 1. And so the various uh, basic variables can impose constraints on my entering variable. So what do I do here? Well, in this case, if I simplify, given that w3 is still going to be 0, y equals 7 over 3 plus one-third w2. What is the largest value I can give to w2 such that y doesn't go negative? And we stare at this and realize, well, wait a minute. Because of the plus sign here, I can give w2 any value I want, and y is still going to be positive. Because I'm not going to give w2 a negative value, there's nothing I can do to w2 that will make y um, go negative which in itself isn't a problem. We saw a case like this in the previous lecture, where there was um, one of the possibilities for a leaving variable had this positive coefficient, in which case we just ignored it, because one of the other variables imposed a bound on my entering variable. OK, but the same thing is happening here. In this case, x equals 2 thirds plus 2 thirds w2. No matter how big I make w2, x will always continue to be non-negative. So there's nothing I can do to w2 that will result in x going negative. Um, and between the two of them, between x and y, and w1, which isn't really participating at all in this, between all of these, it looks like there is no bound on w2. It, um, we know that because we chose it as the entering variable, increasing w2 will increase the objective function. So I want to increase it as much as possible. I know from what's happening down here that there is no limit to how much I can increase it. I can increase it by 10. I can increase it by 100. I can increase it by a million. I can increase it as much as I want, and the objective function will keep getting bigger, and no variables will ever go negative. And so in this case, I can say, I guess there is no leaving variable. The LP must be unbounded. I can make the objective function value as big as I want. And that's why there is no optimal solution. And sure, this is something I have to handle. Obviously, this can happen in the simplex method. But it's sort of nice because it just jumps out at us. If we ever have an entering variable such that there is no bound imposed by any of the possible leaving variables, or you can interpret that as saying there are no candidates to be a leaving variable, if we ever have this situation, then the LP is unbounded, and then we're done. We just report that there is no solution, and we stop. Um, and the formal criteria is, if all of the coefficients on the entering variable in the basis are um, 0 or positive, then the LP is unbounded. So in this case, you could, uh, you could argue that this is actually plus 0 W2. I, I don't write in the 0 because it clutters the diagram, but that really is what's going on there. All of these coefficients are non-negative. Therefore, the entering variable can be increased without bound, and therefore the LP is unbounded. So that gives us a pretty compact test 
for if the LP is unbounded. And it also turns out that if you are trying to solve an LP with a simplex method, because you could be thinking, looking at this and thinking, well, that's great if I encounter this case, but what if the sequence of pivots doesn't take me to this particular situation? Is it possible I'll still get to a situation where I've got some constant minus something minus, I've got a bunch of negative signs and it appears that I have an optimal value? And the answer is no. Um, on your way to the optimal value, if there is an unbounded variable, you will eventually see it and you'll get a case like this. So all you have to do to detect if the LP is unbounded is at each step when you look at your entering variable, verify that there is at least one choice of a leaving variable. If not, then you have an unbounded LP and there is no solution. So that's how we solve the unboundedness problem. And that takes us then to this other issue of what happens if the dictionary that we set up initially isn't feasible? So here I've written out an LP. It is not in standard form um, because of all these greater than signs. The reason I've done this is just to make it more obvious that it may not be clear to you at a glance that an LP will have this problem. Um, it's too easy if I were to write it in standard form to make it look like, oh, it's obvious to you when the LP is initially infeasible. It's true that if you put the LP in standard form, it becomes obvious. But lots of LPs that we see in practice that aren't in standard form may not be initially feasible. And, that's, and they look sort of innocuous, like this. If I put the LP in standard form, oh, whoops, I guess I should talk about this first. The polytope, by the way, so the LP is not initially feasible because when I construct the initial dictionary, it is constructed for the point 0, 0, for x equals 0, y equals 0. And we can see that is not part of the feasible region. However, there is a feasible polytope and it's bounded. It's actually pretty well behaved and the LP has an optimal solution. So obviously, if I'm writing a solver, I need to be able to find that. So this slide is there just to prove that there's, this really isn't that tricky of a linear program. It is something I should reasonably be expect to be able to solve. If I put the LP into standard form, maybe it becomes more obvious what my problem is. So if I flip, I, I, to put in standard form, I have to convert the greater than or equal to signs to less than or equal to signs, which requires flipping everything, so flip, flipping the signs of the um, bounds, and then I end up with all of these negative numbers on the right-hand side of my constraints. And you might notice that in my, if I consider that x and y are set to 0 initially, how am I going to get 0 to be less than or equal to negative 3? That fundamentally is our issue. It manifests itself, I think, a lot easier if we look at the dictionary, because if I look at the initial dictionary created by just converting this with the, the usual conversion by using slack variables into a dictionary, so x and y are non-basic to begin with, which means they're 0. And that means that my slack variables, I can just read off their values. And of course, w1, w2, and w4 are all negative, which I'm not allowed to have. So I'm not allowed to have any of my variables, x, y, or any of the w's, be negative. And if they are negative, I can't run the simplex method. And you can prove this to yourself because basically, if you were to try to run the simplex method, let's say, with x as the entering variable, none of the logic we've used would help you choose a leaving variable because of these negative numbers. You, you need to be working with a feasible dictionary for the pivot operation that we're used to to have the effect that we want, to take us closer to the optimal solution. Um, and so the, the, the key thing here is that we know that we can't work with this because we need all of our variables to always be non-negative or the, the algorithm that we've been using just won't work. So, the reason that um, that this happens is, base, is, I think it's pretty straightforward geometrically, which is that because the dictionaries we construct always put our optimization variables outside of the basis, that means they're always equal to zero to begin with, which means our initial point, if we set up our initial dictionary, is always going to be the all zeros vector. And the all zeros vector isn't feasible. That's it. I, I, if I have a dictionary at any feasible point, then I can run the simplex method. But I don't. This dictionary is at a point that isn't feasible. Um, the other thing I should point out is because both x and y are set to zero and there are no feasible points where either variable equals zero, it isn't really obvious what I'm supposed to do here. Um, I put this, this disclaimer in because maybe if only if there were points, let's say the feasible region went up here. So where x equals zero, there are some feasible points. Maybe if only one variable um, was the problem. So if x could be zero, but y couldn't be zero, you might be able to argue, oh, well, if I do some small manipulation, I'll be safe. Here, I have to get both x and y to be, um, be, be positive values 
to, to not be zero before I can proceed. So it's not really obvious what I'm supposed to do here. Like, I, I know that x and y can't be zero, so I guess they're supposed to be in the basis, but what is supposed to be zero in this case? Um, and of course, also, the fact that the dictionary I constructed first isn't feasible doesn't mean anything as far as the LP is concerned. That's my fault. I can't blame the LP for this. It's just that I've set up a dictionary that doesn't work. The LP can still have feasible and optimal solutions. We know that because here's the feasible region and there's the optimal solution. So this is called an initialization problem. The problem is I don't have a dictionary where I can start the simplex method. That's it. If I did have a dictionary where I could start the simplex method, I could just do that. If it doesn't even matter which point it corresponds to. If it was, if I had a dictionary for this vertex, I could start the simplex method. Maybe I'd walk around this way and I'd get to my optimal solution. But I can't start walking until I'm already at a vertex of the polytope. And I can't use the simplex method unless every variable is non-negative, which in general, especially with our dictionary interpretation where the non-basic variables are zero, only happens at vertices of the polytope. So if I can get any feasible dictionary, then I can start the simplex method. So the question is, how do I get an initial feasible dictionary? Uh, one idea is to cheat. I could say, hey, for some reason, I already have this drawing of the feasible region. And I happen to observe that the point x, y equals 2, 1, so this point here, is a feasible point. Maybe I could convert my initial dictionary. I could, I could find some way of making a dictionary corresponding to this point. And if it's feasible, which I expect that it is, I can then start the simplex method from there. That is valid, except for the weird chicken and egg problem of how did I find the first feasible point? But suppose I have some magic and I know that a particular point is feasible. So I know that the point x, y equals 2, 1 is feasible. How do I construct a feasible dictionary? And the answer is, what I can do is just look at any dictionary. So here's a bad, here's an infeasible dictionary. But because it's a dictionary, it does have a bunch of equations that define each variable. So if I want to know the value of each variable, so I want to know x and y and then each w. What I could do is I could just plug in values for x and y. I know that x equals 2 and y equals 1. So I just plug in so 2, 2, 2. 2 times 3 is 6, y equals 1. All right. Uh, and so I say, well, let's take a look. x equals 2, y equals 1. Uh, w1 would be negative 3 plus 2 plus 1 is 0. w2 would be negative 1 plus 2 is 1. Uh, w3 would be 4 minus 2 is 2. w4 would be negative 1 plus 1 is 0. And w5 would be 20 minus 6 minus 4 is 10. There we go. I now have um, the values of every single variable at that feasible point 2, 1. Okay, but how does that help me? Well, what I want is a dictionary which is feasible. And notice that this variable assignment is feasible, and I can reverse engineer it to figure out what the dictionary should look like. So what do I know about dictionaries and the simplex method? Well, one thing I know is that all of the non-basic variables have to be zero, and that for this problem, there have to be two non-basic variables. In other words, I need w1 and w4, the only two variables that are zero in this assignment, they have to be the non-basic variables. And over here in, this, in the dictionary I started with, the infeasible one, x and y are the non-basic variables, but I know that they have to be basic. So what I could do is I could just pivot the dictionary to put x and y in the basis. So I say x equals and then y equals, and I could wipe them out of the non-basic columns. And then I want to put w1 and w4 uh, as non-basic variables. In other words, I could just pivot, let's say, w1 and x and w4 and y, and that would give me a feasible dictionary. So here's the slides doing the same thing I just did. Um, and so I do that. I just pivot. I know that w1 and w4 are 0, so I pivot them out of the basis. I put x and y in the basis. And if you just the pivots by themselves give me these values. I don't even have to solve for them. The pivoting operation by itself would do this. You can try that out. If you start from this infeasible dictionary and just do two pivots, x and w1 and y and w4, or x and w4 and y and w1. If you just pivot x and y out and w1 and w4 in, just the pivoting by itself will give you this dictionary. It'll give you a feasible dictionary. And you can see it is feasible. w1 and w4 are 0. Everything else is positive. That is a feasible dictionary. I can now run the simplex method starting from there to find the optimal solution. 
Of course, that's not really much of a victory because I started by magically having some uh, feasible point. So how did I get that? I mean, seriously, great, I can convert any dictionary into a feasible one if you tell me a feasible point, but the problem I had all along was that I don't know any feasible points. How can we find literally any feasible point if the all zeros vector isn't feasible? And what I've demonstrated here, which is bringing the dictionary into a feasible form, is essentially what I want to do is I found a feasible point, bring my dictionary to that feasible point, configure the algorithm so that it's starting out at the feasible point. But I can't do that if I don't know where the feasible points are. So what about doing the opposite? Instead of bringing my dictionary to a feasible point, why don't we try bringing the feasible region to, z to the all zero vector? So wh why don't I just try modifying my LP so that zero zero is, all f is always gonna be feasible? Now that's, that's a little bit dangerous, but maybe if I do that, I can find a way of reversing the modification that then gives me something I can work with. And I mean, maybe, maybe, but obviously the fact that I'm covering it means it's gonna succeed. Um, and the result will be something called an auxiliary problem. I really like this. Um, I, the construction isn't what I like so much. It's the fact that the way we end up solving this feels very much close to home for people in a linear programming course. So here's my intuitive interpretation of this. I like starting at 0, 0. And the only reason that I can't start at 0, 0 for this LP is that the constraints are too strict. The constraints, for some reason, have walled me away from 0, 0. They, they've excluded 0, 0 from the solutions. The constraints are too strict. But if I loosen the constraints a little bit, maybe 0, 0 is feasible. Now, obviously, if I do that, I have to find a way of tightening them back up, but I'll worry about that later. Now, the other thing I notice is the reason why 0, 0 isn't feasible is because there are negative numbers on the right-hand side. That's it. That really is the, the reason. We know that if all of the numbers on the right-hand side of the constraints were non-negative, then if I just plug in zeros on the left, the left-hand side comes out to be zero, which will be less than or equal to any non-negative value. So that's the problem. Maybe what I could do is adjust the constraints so that the right-hand side is not negative. One observation I want to make here is um, I mentioned in the the lecture about LP geometry, if you always define your constraints with less than or equal to signs, then the, the normal vector of the uh, constraint, the gradient of the constraint, will always point outside of the half space. So for example, the gradient of this constraint, the normal vector would be negative one, negative one. And it turns out that this constraint here is this line. And the uh, normal vector is negative 1, negative 1, which points away. Similarly, uh, this constraint here, the gradient is 3, 4, and it is this line here. And again, it points out. Um, the reason why I'm pointing that out now is that if I increase the right-hand side, that's going to have the, f the effect of moving the line in the same direction of the normal vector. So if I increase this right-hand side, it moves this line this way. If I increase this right-hand side, it moves this line this way. More generally, if I increase the right-hand side of every constraint by adding a positive number, it moves every wall of the feasible region outwards. The reason I know that it always moves them outwards is, as I said, because I'm always using less than or equal to signs, the normal vector always points outside of the half space. So if I add a positive number, I will make the constraint region bigger, guaranteed. So I'll try that. What if I add 0 0.1? Okay, my original feasible region is this dotted line. So I add 0 0.1 and the feasible region gets a little bit bigger. Okay, it's a little bit closer for my favorite point 0 being feasible, but not close enough. I add 0 0.25. Still not close enough. I keep adding stuff, and eventually I do add a big enough number that 0, 0 is feasible. It turns out 10 is way too big of a number, but um, 10 is still big enough so that what I get what I want, which is that 0, 0 is a feasible point if I add 10 um, to every constraint. So there is something I can do to expand the feasible region to bring it to the point that I prefer. But of course, then there's the question, well, how does that actually help me? Clearly, this is not the same as my original LP. It's got a completely different feasible region. I've just butchered a bunch of the constraints. So the idea is I have something feasible. The point zero, 0, is feasible here if I add some positive number to every constraint. 
Maybe zero, zero won't be feasible if I add a smaller positive number. What I really want to ask is, are there any points x, y that are feasible if the number that I add to the right-hand side is zero? That's the question I want to ask. Is there a uh, assignment x, y such that this linear program where I'm adding zero to everything is feasible? And if so, I'll use that point to construct a feasible dictionary to solve the LP. So the reason that I want to go from here back to that is I think, well, what I want to do then is I want to say, right now, if I start from this and I set uh, x, y to be 0, 0, and instead of the number 10, I add some positive variable. We'll call it, obviously, omega, because it's nice. It's important and mysterious. If I add some number omega, if I set omega to be equal to 10, Actually, I'm going to, I'll am going to write this out as a triple to make it even more obvious where I'm really going with this. So I have my three variables that I'm working with, x, y, and omega. And if I set x to be 0, y to be 0, and oh, whoop, no, omega to be 10, then it's feasible. Then this combination of x, y, and omega is feasible for this linear program. What I want to do is to find out, is there a solution x and y that's feasible if I set omega to be zero? That's the question I'm asking. Can I make omega small enough that I get a feasible solution to my original LP? And more generally, maybe I should be asking not can I get omega to be small enough, let's think about optimization. How small can I make omega such that x, y, omega is still feasible, such that there is some value x, some value y, not necessarily 0, 0, such that it's feasible with these constraints. How small can I make omega? I know that if I set omega to 10, I can set x and y to 0. That gives me a starting point. Then the question is, if I'm allowed to modify x and y and omega, what is the smallest value of omega I could be adding to the right-hand side of every constraint to keep every point uh, to keep the point x, y feasible. And we'll notice, because we know this LP already, there is a point x, y, for example, 2, 1, where if I set omega to be 0, it's still feasible. So the question I want to ask now is, what is the smallest omega that uh, maintains this property? In other words, what I want to do is I want to minimize the value of omega. I want to solve an optimization problem. And fortunately for me, I know how to do that. So uh, I want to maximize my original uh, function with some omega added to it. But then I want to find an omega, the smallest possible omega, such that my point x, y is feasible. So I want to minimize omega subject to this series of constraints. I want to find, and remember that in this uh, LP, uh, the optimization variables are x, y, and omega. x and y are still optimization variables, even though they don't participate in the objective function, and that's valid. So I want to minimize omega such that all of these constraints are um, met for some value x, y, keeping in mind that I know that if I set omega big enough, I can choose x, y to be 0, at least to begin with. Now, the first thing is this is a minimization problem, and I've put a variable on the right-hand side of some constraints. So to actually work with this with the simplex algorithm, I'm going to want to convert it to a maximization problem. So remember that to minimize a function, what you can do is maximize the negation of that function and then just negate the result when you're done. Uh, and I want to move omega over to the left-hand side because it is one of the optimization variables. So I end up with this form. Now, because the key question that we're really asking is, is there a solution where omega just equals zero? I don't actually care about this last negation here. I just want to know, is the optimal solution zero or not? That's all I really care about. If the optimal solution is not zero, it means there is no way to set x and y such that, um, such that uh, this with omega equal to zero is feasible, which means that there is no solution, to, a feasible solution to my original LP. If there is a solution where omega equals zero, it means that I can plug in that solution for x and y to my original LP and get a feasible point. So here is the standard form version of that auxiliary LP with an extra variable omega. Uh, and we're going to solve this LP and use the result to start solving our original LP.
Um, I should also add, uh, while I'm on the subject, that um, this variable omega, depending on which book you read, I think Vanderbay calls it x infinity or x zero or something. X zero sounds boring. X infinity is only a little bit less boring. It's my course. I get to choose. I want a name that's mysterious. I want a name that sounds important. And there is, I, I feel like the gold standard for mysterious important names is uppercase omega, right? There's a certain gravitas you get with Greek, and that's what we're going to use. I'm going to use omega. Um, so just notice also there's this, this slide's pointing this out, but um, this is the minimization problem we're actually solving. This is that problem as a maximization problem in standard form. Notice how I have to move omega around, which flips the sign, so it goes from being plus omega on the right to negative omega on the left. And I have to flip the sign in the objective function because I'm changing to maximization. When I convert this to, to a dictionary, I end up flipping the sign again because I'm moving omega back across an equal sign. So I know that's a little bit bizarre, but I end up with this. So I realize that the sign keeps flipping. That is actually correct. It is deliberate. So I have this, I now have this dictionary for my auxiliary problem. And the very first thing you ought to notice is it's still not feasible. So what was the point? I mean, I can talk about how we're solving some auxiliary problem, but I haven't seemed to actually solve the issue that got me here in the first place, which is I've got variables that are negative. I can't run the simplex method. So that's true. This is not a feasible dictionary. The difference is I know a lot more about what I have to do to make this feasible because I understand what it meant to construct this. So I'm going to scroll back. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to minimize the value of omega uh, such that these constraints hold. And I know, based on this argument I made earlier about expanding my feasible region, that if I add a large enough positive value to the right-hand side of every constraint, the point zero, 0, will be feasible. So I just need to set omega to a large positive value. I actually don't even have to make it that big. If you look at it carefully, all you need is for the right-hand side of every constraint to be zero or positive. And you might notice that the way you can do that is just find the smallest negative value and then set omega to be the negation of that. So negative three is the smallest value on the right-hand side. So if I say omega is equal to three, then all of these things will come out to be non-negative. Okay, so I know what omega is for. The key here is that I understand because I constructed this LP with a purpose, the point of omega. I know that what I want to do to make this feasible is to set omega to be equal to three. Okay, so then we'll go back to our apparently infeasible dictionary. I know why this is infeasible. Because omega is non-basic, which means it has to be zero. And I know that to make the problem feasible, omega has to equal 3. So all I have to do is think of a way of setting omega to be 3 in this dictionary. Okay, well, the first observation is we understand that for the simplex method, all non-basic variables are 0. So I know that I have to make omega basic. So I have to put omega in the basis somewhere. The next question is, where do I put omega in the basis? So I, I basically want to do a pivot. I want to take, have omega enter the basis and something leave the basis. So what do I choose as my leaving variable? And that's actually pretty easy too if I think about what I actually need. When omega is in the basis, I want omega to equal 3. So 3 plus minus dot. I want the row for omega to start with the number 3. And so I begin thinking to myself, where might I get a 3 around here? And I notice that um, in this case, if I choose w1 and I rewrite that to be defined in terms of omega, I get omega equals 3 plus y plus w1. And that seems like it gives me exactly what I want. If I pivot with omega entering and w1 leaving, then I will get omega equals 3. And that means that if omega equals 3, all of those negative numbers will go away. Uh, so the way I actually chose that, if we want to avoid the intuition, all we do here is we go looking for um, the least feasible constraint. In other words, the uh, value in the basis that has the smallest negative value. That is the thing we choose as our leaving variable. So we set up the initial dictionary for our, our auxiliary LP. Then we do one pivot, where we pivot omega out uh, sorry, omega into the basis, it enters the basis, and we have whichever slack variable has the smallest value, so in this case w1, it leaves the basis. So we do that pivot, here's the result. Notice that in the result, omega is in the basis, and all of my basic variables are now non-negative. And of course, these are all zero, which means this is a feasible dictionary. In doing this, the objective value became negative 3. 
So notice how that actually means that in the, the pivot that I just did, the objective value went down. We would never do a pivot like this during the simplex algorithm for a lot of reasons, one of which is omega isn't a valid entering variable for the simplex algorithm because it has a negative coefficient. But remember from the past couple of lectures that all I'm doing when I pivot is rearranging equations. I can pivot for whatever reason I want. I can pivot any variable into or out of the basis for any reason. I choose specific pivots in the simplex algorithm to achieve a certain effect, but I'm allowed to pivot for any other reason that I want. And in this case, I pivot because I know that one pivot will be enough to get me to a feasible dictionary, which is this. And the objective value goes down. And now what I do is I have a feasible dictionary for my auxiliary LP. And so I solve it. I run the simplex method. And what I'm looking for is whether the optimal solution is zero or not. If the optimal solution is non-zero, it means there's no way of reducing omega to zero um, such that the point x, y is feasible. And that means there is no way of satisfying my original constraints. If the, objective, if the optimal value is zero, it means there is some point x, y that meets my original set of constraints. So I'll run the simplex method. I'll just talk through the steps here. First, uh, x enters and w4 leaves. Then y enters and omega leaves, strangely. So we, we noticed a few minutes ago we had omega non-basic, but we had an infeasible dictionary. After doing some manipulations, we end up with omega being non-basic, but we do have a feasible dictionary, which we can now work with. So this is optimal, the objective value is zero. And also notice that because omega is, no, is non-basic, it's all, also obviously equal to zero. So now I have this dictionary that describes an optimal solution to my auxiliary LP. It tells me there is a solution, a value x, y, um, where omega is zero that satisfies the constraints. In particular, x equals two and y equals one, which might look familiar. That was in fact the vertex of the uh, feasible region that we worked with in the earlier example. So here's what I could do. I could take this knowledge and I could use it to reconstruct a dictionary for the original LP, just like I did earlier. So in that earlier example where I knew that I had a feasible point, I then manipulated the dictionary to reflect that feasible point, and then I have a feasible dictionary. That would work. Now, there are some reasons why um, that might not be the best idea. So one of them is if I just start from x equals 2, y equals 1 and build the dictionary from scratch, the dictionary in this example has five rows, but I could be working with a problem with a thousand constraints. It turns out there actually is a way of taking this optimal auxiliary dictionary and converting it into a feasible uh, original dictionary by doing some manipulation but only if the optimal objective value of the auxiliary function is zero. And I'm gonna show that transformation because I think it's very useful. I think it can save a lot of time. So the first thing is, if I'm working with my original LP, do I have my original LP somewhere here? It's way back. Um, so here's my original LP. Uh, I guess I want a standard form of it somewhere here. Uh, here it is. Here's my original LP in standard form. Um, obviously, this LP does not involve a variable omega. So that's, a, that's the first thing I have to observe. Um, and it involves the objective function 2x plus y. So now we'll scrub back through here. Um, so what I need to do is find a way of removing the parts that clearly are not part of my original LP. So in particular, my original LP did not have a variable omega. That's one big thing I need to get rid of. But it turns out that that's easy because in my optimal auxiliary dictionary, omega is equal to zero, which means if I just wipe it out, if I just get rid of omega completely, everything else still holds up. I mean, you could argue that the original LP is just a special case of this where omega equals zero. So I'll just set omega to be permanently zero by deleting omega from everything. Okay, that's easy. And remember, that only works because omega actually equals zero in my auxiliary uh, dictionary. I should make one other observation, which is that because omega is non-basic, wiping it out is really easy. I just delete the column. It's possible to end up at an optimal auxiliary dictionary, not yet. Later in the course, we'll see this. It's possible to end up at an optimal auxiliary dictionary where omega is basic, so you have a row in the basis where omega does equal zero, but it's for some reason in the basis. Um, if you want to deal with that, if you're writing a solver, 
what you have to do is pivot omega out of the basis and then delete the column. You can't delete omega as a variable unless it is non-basic. Because you know you expect it to be zero, you can always find a way of getting it out of the basis and then you can delete it. So we do that, that gets rid of omega, but we have one other problem, which is that when we solved our auxiliary LP, we were solving um, this LP, minimize omega, not maximize the original objective function. So we solved an LP with the wrong objective function. We have to find a way of getting our original objective function back in to our um, auxiliary dictionary as we're, as we're pruning it down. So we delete omega, and then we have this problem. We need to somehow get this dictionary to contain our original objective function. So the original objective function was 2x plus y. You might notice it's not, I can't just, you know, fill that in. That wouldn't make any sense because obviously X and Y are not non-basic variables here. And if they were, we'd have a problem because that would mean they were both zero and we know that the point zero, zero isn't feasible. So I need some way of representing the objective function 2X plus Y, but I need to keep X and Y in the basis. It turns out that we actually have a remedy to that. So I need this to be 2X plus Y but I can only use the variables w4 and w1 and maybe a constant. But I have a remedy because I know what x and y are. So here's x and here's y. So what's 2x plus y? Well, it sounds to me like it's 2 times 2 minus w4 plus w1 plus, and then y is 1 plus w4. Or I'll expand that out, 4 minus 2w4 plus 2w1 plus 1, um, plus uh, w4, and then we'll just collect some like terms here. We get 5 minus w4 plus 2w1. Well, there we go. There's a way of expressing this in terms of w4 and w1. So I'll just fill that in. 5 minus w4 plus 2w1, and there we go. We now have a dictionary that we can verify is feasible for my original LP. You could even go back and, ver and, and check that if you were to take the dictionary, the, the, that infeasible initial dictionary, and just pivot x with w4 and y with w1, you would get this exact dictionary. So now I have a feasible dictionary to the original LP, and I can solve that using the simplex method. Um, I guess we're going to do that. I've left in the steps so that you can use this for practice. Um, w3, or w1 enters, w3 leaves, w4 enters, w5 leaves, and now I am sitting at the optimal solution. There are no positive coefficients of the objective function, so I can't improve the value any further, and the objective value is 10. So where does that leave us? Well, we now know that for an arbitrary LP in standard form, this is the way a simplex-based solver works. And this actually addresses pretty much all of the special cases except for um, what happens if it never finishes. So this now covers all of the ways an LP can behave. So an LP, if I give you an arbitrary LP, there are three situations you can find yourself in. Situation one is that there are no feasible points at all. If that happens, um, then our auxiliary problem will converge to a value of omega that is greater than zero. There's also the case where the LP has feasible points, but the objective function can become arbitrarily large. We've already talked about that in this lecture. And then finally, the third case, the one we sort of want, is the case where there is an optimal solution. There is both a set of feasible points and one of them is, or more than one of them, but there is a specific maximum uh, among the feasible region. So here is the process, the, the, the general algorithm for that. First, construct your initial dictionary. If it isn't feasible, construct the auxiliary problem by bringing in that proxy variable omega. Then we, we, we uh, do that one pivot that we need to do to make the, the auxiliary dictionary feasible, and then we solve the auxiliary problem with the simplex method. And the optimal solution of the auxiliary problem will either be zero, which means we can re reduce omega to zero, and that means that there is a feasible solution of the original LP, or non-zero. If the auxiliary problem has a non-zero maximum, um, or minimum, or optimal solution, then the original LP has no feasible points and it is infeasible. Otherwise, if we get to a point where omega equals, that's not omega, if we get to a point where omega equals zero, then we uh, perform that transformation I just mentioned to eliminate omega from the auxiliary dictionary and get us a, a feasible dictionary for the original problem. Once I have such a thing, 
I then run the simplex um, method on that, and either I reach a point where I have an entering variable that is unbounded, in which case the LP has no solution because it's unbounded, or I reach a point where uh, there are no positive objective coefficients, in which case I have arrived at the optimal solution. Now, this is the this is it. This is the simplex method. We still have a whole bunch of explaining to do that'll get us to the sort of unspoken thing here is that what if the method doesn't finish? So if the method, if the algorithm gets to the end, the end will either be infeasible, unbounded, or optimal. But there is still this problem that if the algorithm is walking around vertices of a polytope, what happens if it walks in a circle for all eternity? What happens if it never reaches any of these end states? Is that possible? And if so, how do we prevent it? And that is something we'll talk about in the next lecture. We also can then, once we verify that, that is the final um, brick that we need to build this, this picture of correctness of the simplex algorithm. Once we can prove that the simplex algorithm actually works for any LP, we can begin retracing our steps and um, nailing down a few proofs of theoretical results that we needed by using the algorithm as one of the pieces of those proofs. And then we can begin exploring some interesting theoretical properties of LPs in general, again, using the algorithm to help um, motivate us along the way.